Now this morning, I'm taking out what we generally say after we read scripture. This just doesn't seem to fit, thanks be to God. Uh, (laughs) But this passage is still important nonetheless. I think it's safe to say that in this moment in history, Joseph and his brothers, they're probably not the best of friends. And after all, our families are supposed to be our safe places, filled with folks that love us, filled with folks that care for us no matter what. And while I sincerely pray that none of you have ever experienced the kind of family situation we just read about, I think we're all wise enough to know that there are a plethora of situations that happen within our families. So regardless of our family makeup, background, size, how near or far we live with one another, traditions we observe, the the depth that we may or may not enjoy in each other's lives, what happens in our families, the emotions that we experience as a result of it, all leave their mark. Hopefully the good things that we have experienced as a member of our families comprise most of those influences, but everything leaves that mark. So over the next several weeks, we're going to look at a few of those family dynamics, where we find them in scripture, and what our faith can teach us about how to recognize them, about how to navigate them, and about how to understand them. So right now this morning, I want to invite you to take just a moment and think about your family of origin, that family that you grew up with. Go back as far as you can or as you care to and think about who was or who is a part of your family. Think about the memories that you have of those folks, the times that you spent together, and think about how those experiences And those people shaped you. I grew up in a big family where having 20 to 25 people gathered around a table together was the norm. I am one of nine cousins on my mom's side. I spent most of my adolescence with two great grandmothers, one of which lived with us both sets of grandparents, and five sets of aunt and uncles, not to mention my parents, all close by. I have great memories of those times, of large two-week family vacations to the beach, living the normality of everyday life with my grandparents and my great-grandmothers, experiencing those special family moments, and now getting to walk down memory lane as we remember them with one another. It may tell you something about our family that one Thanksgiving as we're gathered around the table, my great uncle remembered that his grandfather had terrible arthritis. And the way that he dealt with that is he took one of the old hand crank telephones and turned it into an electric conductor. And out of the side were two metal key rings and Poppy, as they called him, was told by his doctor every night to grip both of those key rings, and as he turned the handle, it would generate a current. And for him to go as fast and as long as he could, and every night, his hands would go from this to this. So my family talked about it, and as they were talking about it, my dad went and got that out of the attic. And we sat around the table and shocked each other. Great family memories of us spending time together. Now, not every moment with my family was as electrifying as that. They were not all idyllic. They were not all from some Norman Rockwell painting. We fought. We fight. We disagreed with each other. We, we've gotten on each other's nerves. At times, we've had to take, just had to take a break from one another and get some space, and it's feelings that I'm sure each and every one of you have felt to some degree in your lives as well. And I pray for you that those harder feelings were the exception rather than being the norm. But Joseph's familial experience that we read about at the end of Genesis is something else entirely. We're introduced to Joseph as a a 17-year-old in Genesis 37. He was serving as a shepherd in his family with his brothers, 
and he was the second youngest son of Israel. Now Israel, who is previously and perhaps more commonly known to most of us as Jacob. Scripture shares with us that Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons because, as verse 3 puts it, he was the son of his old age. Now on the surface, a father loving a son is a wonderful thing. However, this is more than that. Israel's love of Joseph had grown to be greater than his love for his other children, making Joseph Israel's favorite child. Now, this is just not something that Joseph's brothers thought. They had it confirmed when Israel presented Joseph with a long robe with sleeves, cementing that favorite son status. Now, to be fair, Joseph, he didn't exactly do a lot to push off this idea. You see, just prior to what we read this morning in verse 2, Joseph has taken a bad report of his brother's to his father. And when we read further in Genesis, we find that fresh on the heels of Joseph receiving this gift of a robe, he shares two dreams he had with his brothers, one that foretold of them bowing down before Joseph in the future, and the second dream had not only his brothers, but his entire family bowing down before him. So in the midst of sibling rivalry, I think we can see how these hard feelings started to develop between Joseph and his brothers. As we read further into Genesis, we see how these feelings of Joseph being the favorite continue to manifest and unfold. In verse 14, Joseph is sent by his father to go and and check on his brothers who are tending sheep in a different land. After a period of travel and searching, Joseph finally locates them in the land of Dothan. Now, the feelings between Joseph and his brothers are so damaged and broken at this point by this favorite child perception that when his brothers see Joseph in the distance, they don't plot to hide. They don't plot to to try and see if he can go another way and not notice them. They plot to confront him and kill him, to further disdain their their. In their further disdain for Joseph, they even mock him as he is approaching, saying, Here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we will see what becomes of his dreams. Setting up Joseph as the favorite child caused such a rift in the family that death was a viable option. One of the brothers, Reuben, protests how they are going to take care of Joseph. He, he gives them a different plan. He says, instead of killing him and throwing him in a pit, he tries to convince them just to, to throw him in the pit and let him live. Just let him be. You see, Reuben's plan is once they all leave, he's going to return to the pit. He's going to retrieve Joseph and bring him home to their father. If Reuben can get his brothers to agree to this, that is the plan that he's going to do. And he does. He gets them to say, okay, we'll just take his robe and we will just throw Joseph into the pit. So they do that. When Joseph gets close enough, they strip him of his robe and they throw him in the pit. But the story isn't over. You see, before the brothers leave the area and go back home with the robe, they see a caravan of Ishmaelites passing by. And they decide to sell Joseph for 20 pieces of silver to this traveling caravan, unbeknownst to Reuben. So after collecting their money, the brothers then take the robe that belonged to Joseph. They slaughter a goat and they dip the robe in its blood and they return home. They give the bloodstained robe to their father and then they stand to the side and they watch. They watch as Israel examines the robe comes to the conclusion that it is the one that he gifted to his son Joseph. And then they continue to watch as Israel comes to the false conclusion that Joseph has been devoured by wild animals and is dead. Never stepping in to correct the facts, never stepping in to relieve the the grief that their father is feeling. They allow all of this to happen. In fact, the the grief for Israel is so deep 
that he refuses to be consoled by anyone in his family. Next great script for a holiday movie, huh? There is deep trouble in this family. Israel's favoritism of Joseph has impacted so negatively that it's driven an incredible wedge, brother between brother, children between father. Now, not to keep you in suspense, things do get better for Joseph's family. Relationships are repaired through God's redemption. And so if you, if you haven't read this story, or maybe it's, it's been a while since you've gone through it, I encourage you, I invite you to go back and pick it up and read it again. Start in chapter 37, read through the end of Genesis. You'll be glad you did. I highly recommend it. Now, earlier, I invited you to think about your family of origin. Those, those people that you grew up with. Maybe favoritism was something you had to navigate. As I look back over my family as the, the eldest son, the eldest cousin, the eldest grandson, I was the first one to be able to do certain things. I was the first one to go on a fishing trip by myself with my granddaddy. I was the first one to be old enough to keep an eye on that entire brood as we ran around Sefner. I was the first one to graduate high school and college. And truth be told, I liked it. I liked being the oldest. I liked being the first one to do things. I liked being in charge. It made me feel important. It made me feel special. But what I remember most about all of those interactions was how my mom and my dad and all of my grandparents and my aunts and my uncles kept me grounded. They didn't allow that, that feeling of being special to, to be hyperinflated or become more important than understanding who I was as a child of God. There was one time my younger brother was getting on my very last nerve. There's five years between me and my little brother and he was born with one of his spiritual gifts being button location. He could find my buttons and he could find them quick. <laughs> and not only did he find them, he had this knack for pushing them. And as all little brothers do, he liked to push not just one or two, but, you know, all of them at the same time. One day in an event of extraordinary button pushing... I reached my, my end. I reached my breaking point. I took a deep breath, and I grabbed him by his, gently. I took his hand. <laughs> and I walked him to my mother in the living room. And I put his hand inside of hers, and I said, you need to return this one. <laughs> Have another one. Give it to me, and I'll raise it right. And I walked off. Thoroughly convinced I had come up with the solution of all solutions. This was going to benefit everybody. Well, mom let me go. And a few minutes later, she came and she found me and she sat me down and she shared with me a very valuable truth. She said she loved my brother and I very, very much. And she loved my little brother just as much as she loved me. Now, I must have shot her a look because the conversation didn't end there. She followed it up and said, and I can do that because God has given me enough love for you both. Never forgotten that statement. And I think it's because it's one where its great truth is continuing to be revealed to me day in and day out. With God as our heavenly father, it can be very comforting to know that God has enough love for each and every one of us, the children of God. Now, have you ever really pondered that truth for all of us? Have you, have you ever really thought about the depth of that statement? Now, intellectually, we can come to grips with the idea that God loves all of us and he loves us equally. The, the statement makes sense. But how often have we really gone to the depths to unpack it, not only does God love all of humanity, God loves all of humanity equally. Come on. We're different people, folks. 
We think differently. We, we view this world different, differently. We have experienced our lives differently. We have contributed to our communities differently. Does God truly love us equally in the midst of all that different? Yes. Yes, God does. No favorites. No one above another. Just love for us all. Now, there are times that having a favorite thing is wonderful. Last week in our social media accounts, I asked people, what are your favorite things? It could be a people, a place, an event, a time, an occasion. And some of the answers I got back were, were family, nature, being outside, Disney, video games, soup, biking, and my favorite on this list of favorites, chocolate. Yay, chocolate. Favorite things and places can bring us a sense of hope, of joy, of something to look forward to. You know, as I read that list, if any of those were your favorites, chances are you probably smiled a little bit. When we can live in that anticipation of our favorite thing, when, when we can set time aside to indulge in our favorite food, our favorite place, our, our favorite thing, our brains do something. They release dopamine and oxytocin and serotonin and endorphins and, and these chemicals, these neurotransmitters, they relieve pain. They heighten our mood. They promote trust and bonding in relationships. And I think all of us can agree that's good stuff. But when we allow ourselves to see someone, another person as our favorite, and allow those resulting actions to lead others to feel that maybe they're not welcome, that they're not respected, appreciated, or loved very much. And in the worst case, to have those feelings confirmed, one's mood can darken. Our self-worth can take a dive, and it's, it's not long before we start to see physical manifestations of this emotional reaction, especially when it happens in a family situation. Once I had children of my own, the, the truth of my mom's statement became even more powerful to me, that, that God had given her enough love for both my brother and I came through in my own experience. If you've ever spent any time with my boys, you know they are completely different from one another. Different gifts, different joys, different personalities, and I love them ferociously and equally. And I think that is the example that God has set for us. Modeled in how he offered redemption to Joseph's family later in Genesis, proven in how God rescued God's people throughout the stories of the Old Testament, and most certainly evident in God's incarnation through Christ and the salvation that is now ours through that life, through that ministry, through that love. And what a wonderful reminder for us to take away from worship today. That we are valued. That we are loved. And that God showers us with that value and that love all equally. But this message today is just not about that idea. About that understanding or the fact that God loves all of humanity. The main point of my standing before you today is to ask all of us the question, given this knowledge of God's love, how are we going to be different tomorrow than we are today? Knowing that you are loved, knowing that you are part of this church family, and this family is called to undergird and show you that love, knowing that as a member of this family, you get to practice loving one another, knowing that there are people in our lives, in our circles, and our path that do not know this love and need you to be the one to share it with them, how are we going to be different tomorrow than we are today? How are we going to see this world and the people in it different tomorrow than we do today? That, my family, is our challenge. To look to God to show us that path to allow God to make that change within us and make us ready for that path. And then to embrace the opportunity to walk and to live 
on that path. Favoritism almost destroyed Joseph and his family. It drove a deep wedge between them, took them to a a very deep and dark place. And their family is not unique. Favoritism can cause damage in any family today. But God, our God, our Father in heaven, showed us the power that comes in love for all. Love that is seen in God's countless redemption of humanity. Love that is seen in Christ, God incarnate, and His ministry and resurrection. And love that can be given and shared within this church family. My family, love each other. When it's easy, love deeply. When it's hard, love intentionally. Just love. And watch how God moves in those moments. And often in ways that are far beyond the most wonderful things we have ever imagined. Will you pray with me? Almighty Father, we humbly bow before you this day. And we thank you for the love that is ours. The love that you give to us so freely. The love that that chases after us. The love that, that remakes us and remolds us the love that is ours, and there's nothing we can do to change it. You have made that decision. You have led us by that example that love is not because of something we do. Love just is. And so this day we ask that you give us the strength to to be remade in that love, not just once, not just twice, but Father, each and every morning, may we be made anew remade in your image to claim that love in our lives, to live with that perspective, knowing that that we have value and love in you. It's understanding that. It's living into that. It's finding strength from that that gives us the courage to go out into this world and to share those exact same things with others. I ask that you work in the life of this church and the the people that are a part of this family. That you give us those opportunities, that you show us those people, that you open those doors that will allow us to go and stand boldly for you. To proclaim your, your love equality. To proclaim the value. Help us to see this world the exact way that you see it. Help us to be the church that in the midst of uncertainty, that in the midst of trying times, in the midst of celebratory moments, that we can be those people that build your kingdom, that share your love, and that welcome people home. We thank you for the gifts that you have shown us in the past. We thank you for the charge that you have given us for the future. And glorious Father, We look forward with great anticipation to everything that you are going to do through us. And we pray all of this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.